Well, it says we're live. Hello, everyone. It's Tuesday, 4 o'clock Pacific, 6 o'clock Central, and 6 o'clock here in Costa Rica, 7 o'clock in New York, uh, midnight in Dublin, 1 a.m. in Italy, 8.30 and 9.30 a.m. Wednesday morning in Australia, somewhere around 3 in the afternoon in New Zealand on Wednesday, and it's Facebook Live. And I'm really excited that We've got my good friend, Dr. Christine Schaffner back. Um, this is our third time, I think, together in a relatively short period. Hi, Dr. Schaffner. It's so good to see you. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's just a, a blast. It's a blast. And I'm going to look on my phone here. I don't have Marzi here today to help me with this. So as soon as I can find where we are, I'll, oh, there we go. There's videos. Let's see if we can, uh, so I can give some shout outs here. Uh, tell us who's out there. Say hello, everyone, and um, we'll get this going. But in the meantime, until I can figure out how to pull this up, because it's not pulling up, um, we're talking about electromagnetics today. Mm -hmm. And uh, just as a background for people, in my book, You Can Fix Your Brain, I talked about the pyramid of health that there are four sides to a pyramid. And so, no, there's only three. No, there's four. There's also a base. And then the three sides that are sticking up that meet. Mm -hmm. And the base is your structure. And we have to look at any health problem from a pyramid point of view, meaning there's four different categories, general categories to look at. Structure, the home of chiropractic and massage and orthopedics and, uh, 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 inserts in your shoes and how you adjust your car seat to take he to get help headaches go away because you're sitting like this. And that's all structure. One side is biochemistry where we focus most of our attention. That's what we eat and drink and drugs and nutrition. One side is emotional or spiritual and one side is the electromagnetic. And that any of those sides of the pyramid of health can be the primary culprit so Dr. Schaffner, let's just start off. Most people don't know about um, EMFs. They've heard something about 5G, but how does EMFs impact on our health? Let's start there. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I know that you've had this framework for a long time looking beyond our biochemistry and beyond our physical body that we have this electromagnetic nature. And I think, you know, it's interesting, Dr. Tom, that I think, you know, starting with EMF is such a great um, point because I think in a weird way, we're at a tipping point in people understanding this um, body electric or this electromagnetic nature um, of our bodies and how we're wired because we're um, inundated and we're um, in our everyday use, we're using cell phones and Wi-Fi and there's these invisible fields of information and energy that, you know, um, that we use every day. So I think it's becoming more, um, you know, more of a language and an understanding that maybe we can apply that beyond, you know, EMF to understand also how nature or how our bodies could be wired. And, you know, with EMF, um, you know, again, it's all about the frequency. So there's healing frequencies in the electromagnetic spectrum, and then there are going to be things that over time that can um, have cumulative effects over a body that can create a uh, disease and imbalance. And so, when I think about the world of EMF, I think about, again, we think of cell phones, Wi-Fi, could be the 5G tower. I live in Seattle. They're in my neighborhood now, unfortunately, uh, smart meters um, and so forth. And, um, you know, there's many mechanisms and there's a couple mechanisms that really ring true to me that I feel like people can, um, you know, start to grasp. And one, I um, have an upcoming summit and Dr. Beverly Rubick, who I've been friendly with over the years, and she's a biophysicist out of uh, UC Berkeley. Berkeley, and she really, um, she actually termed the, uh, coined the term um, biofield that's in PubMed in the 1990s, so people could study energy medicine in this way, but she studied EMF and the impact on her physiology, and what she found is with a 20-minute um, cell phone um, on your body, for if you had a um, cell phone on your body that was connected to 4G for 20 minutes, just that alone, um, and then she would um, take the blood of that person and look in the microscope and see what changes um, they saw. And they found that it was um, consistent 
that the blood um, of people who had a cell phone on their body um, formed rouleau or that it was more um, these stacked red blood cells that were um, an indicator that our blood was more thick, that it wasn't um, potentially circulating as well. So how does, you know, flow, right? We need good blood flow in our body to exchange oxygen and bring nutrients and exchange waste. And so, um, and, and then she saw a change in the red blood cells. Well, let's, let's pause there for a minute. The the rouleau formation, people don't know what that is. It's called the money chip or the poker chip. <laughs> it looks like that. It does look like that. The red blood cells stack on top of each other. Mm -hmm. So then they can't carry oxygen and they can't carry. And it's a big problem with COVID is mm -hmm. rouleau formation. It's a huge problem that mm -hmm. sets people up to be vulnerable to having a severe reaction to the exposure to the virus. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So, and I had rouleau formation when we were at uh, Swiss Mountain Clinic in Switzerland. Uh -huh. uh, I, I think this was the time three years ago, maybe four years ago. And they do live cell analysis as one of their screens means they poke your finger, put a drop of blood on a slide, put it under a microscope and show it on the TV. Uh -huh. And so you see all the stuff in your blood and you see all the crud that's there and all, you know, the, the yeast, if you've got a bunch of yeast or bacteria, you, you see it and we're too much fat, wrong kind of fat. And so they put my blood up on the screen and it was a rouleau formation. There were a bunch of money chips. And I said, whose blood is that? And she <laughs> said, yours. I said, no, it's not. It's not. I'm sorry, Dr. O'Brien, this is yours. We just did this. You, I said, you switched the slides. No, I didn't. And um, it just, just dropped my plate, heart. right? And you might have just come off of the plane, right? It might have, you know. Well, perhaps. <laughs> but, uh, but this is the precursor for strokes. Mm -hmm. This is a precursor for heart attacks. Mm -hmm. When your red blood cells stack up like that, you know, you got this thick crud of red blood cells, and you don't have each individual one floating around doing its job. They're stuck together. That's a rouleau formation. And so I saw that in my test and I had brought a bunch of things with me because uh, we we're going to spend a few weeks there. And so I said, we'll do this again tomorrow. And she said, oh, this doesn't change very quickly, doctor. And I said, oh, okay, we'll just do it again tomorrow. And I went back and I hit the adaptogens really hard that night. And next day I went back and my blood was normal. And I've got the pre and post on that, which is just a cute story. But what you're saying is that just having a cell phone on your body, just having it on your body for 20 minutes increases rouleau formation. Yeah, it's wild. And, you know, one of the things she taught me, because this can get overwhelming very quickly, right? Because we're, you know, exposed to all these things all the time and we don't live in a bubble. And so how do we, you know, move forward in life? I'm making some changes that can really have an impact. And she shared with me that I um, try to educate my patients is if you can do one thing to start protecting yourself and reducing your exposure to EMF is really self uh, safe um, cell phone hygiene, right? And not uh, keeping your cell phone on your body or putting it near your head. I know you've been a great proponent to Dr. Tom of the Faraday cages that you can put your phone in. And so that can also lessen, um, you know, the exposure, but that alone, if you just take one thing from this talk today and just don't put your, you know, phone in your pocket or carry it on your body and distance, distance is your friend for all of these um, equations of how EMF can affect us. And so putting it away from your body will be um, really significant in helping your blood to be optimal in its um, ability to circulate. Yeah, really, a good, really a good point. And uh, what Dr. Schaffner is referring to on mine is called Faraday cages. And this is a case on my phone. It comes from Pong, P-O-N-G. And I got it on Amazon and I don't know if it's the best company or not, but when I got it um, and it blocks the radiation coming to, from the phone and, you know, I, my car is an Acura. And mm -hmm. when I walk up to the car, a message from my team tells the car he's here mm -hmm. and the lights come on uh, shining down on the ground by the door and the door handle lights come on, you know, just the, and the internal lights, the dome lights come on before I unlock the car. And then I touch the door handle and unlocks. And that's great, it's a nice little thing, you know, I like that. Mm -hmm. But if I'm carrying my keys in the same hand as my phone with the Pong case on it, it doesn't work. The car key doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And I just, 
what's wrong with the car? Key? Oh, wait a minute. And then I switch hands and hold the car key in this hand. Now it works. And so that validates for me that this is doing something. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I'm glad to use it. And as you're saying, if there's only one little thing you do, this might be it. This mm -hmm. might have the biggest effect. And I'll put another one on there. Every night, Marzi and I turn off the Wi-Fi mm -hmm. before we go to sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, we always turn it off. And I don't turn it on in the morning until we need it, right? So you're reducing your exposures at least for a period of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's such a great tip. And again, you know, it's um, when we're in the sea um, of EMF exposure, it's like, what can we do to, again, reduce those moments? And I think, you know, Wi-Fi um, is only needed when we uh, need to use it. So again, turning it off at night, I try to inform my patients that as well. And then only turning it on when you need it or even wiring um, your home office or your office at work where you can use an ethernet um, cable, that can be another tool and strategies. There's a lot of hacks, you know, um, to help support you. And I think, um, you know, I like to focus to Dr. Tom on the sleeping location because I think, um, again, that's the time where our brain detoxifies and that our body repairs. And if um, God willing, I know you have a newborn, but if you get eight hours of sleep, <laughs> you know, that's a time where- oh, you from your lips, from your lips. <laughs> I know uh, my daughter is two and a half, so I I've quickly forgotten what what realm you're in. But I you know it's it's so short lived for you know the joy that um, you know you're in, in um, having right now. But I, I hear you. You're not probably your melatonin is probably all confused right now, right? Um, with I'm your sure it is. <laughs> I know, isn't it? Don't young, um, um, you know, newborns don't produce melatonin at appropriate hours, right? And so that's probably why, you know, that's part of their obviously right. development, but um, that's a whole nother topic. But uh, what I'm just trying to impart is that if you can create a safe sleeping location, um, that is a break from that cumulative exposure. Hopefully you're getting eight hours of sleep and that's a break from the 24 hour cycle. And then again, it's giving you not only um, helpful for sleep, there's so many of my patients who have insomnia and when we do EMF um, mitigating strategies, their sleep improves. Um, so it not only helps um, you sleep better, but then also gives your body a break so you can do the healing work that you need at night. Right, right. So for those of you that haven't heard of this, I'm going to ask Dr. Schaffner to tell us in a moment, I'm going to do some shout outs, but um, she referred to the glymphatic system. And that's a new term for a lot of people. And it's really a critically important one because it deals with drainage of the brain, toxins mm -hmm. from the brain. Mm -hmm. So first of all, a shout out to Jennifer from Virginia. Hi, Jennifer. Tammy's here from Florida. Alice Stoddard's here from the state of Virginia. Hi, mm -hmm. Alice. Uh, Laura's here. Hey, Laura. Uh, Sarah's in Pittsburgh, uh, Cynthia's here saying hi, uh, and with a little logo of broccoli. Okay. <laughs> uh, Cindy's here from Pennsylvania. Uh, and my team posted, it says, you know, here's where we'll put all the links that we're going to talk about today. Um, and we, we've already posted for the body electric and that's something I'd recommend everyone register for. So you can learn more about these kind of tips. Shanquila is here and says, hi, been on B12 supplements, but even injections, but still have high MCV. What could that be? Is it related to gluten at all? Been gluten free for one plus years. Any ideas are really helpful. Okay, Shanquila, we'll come back to you in just a minute. I just want to do a few more shout outs. Uh, 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 well, oh, the doctor.com is, we just put up some information about what Rouleau is. Great. Mm -hmm. Al says, what do low white blood cells mean and can gluten be related? Okay, let's go back first to the uh, question from Sean Quilla on B12 supplements with high MCV, mean corpuscular volume, volume, and what could be the trigger for that? Uh, Dr. Christine, you want to start with that one? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, um, you're onto the B12. So MCV, I usually think when it's above 90, 92, that there can be a um, B12 deficiency, but also there could be folate deficiencies. So making sure that you're also getting um, ideally methylated folate. Um, and so if you're, you know, having those equations, right. And as you said, you're bypassing the gut with an injection. So that's, you know, trying to enhance absorption. There could be um, again, folate would be the first thing I think about. And then a lot of um, my patients have um, issues with dysbiosis in their gut that can prevent um, absorption of these um, you know, vitamins. So I would um, look at potentially 
um, I've been using a GI map test or kind of just clinically, you know, looking at if there could be bacterial overgrowth, fungal overgrowth, even parasitic overgrowth that can um, be um, stealing your B12 um, or your uh, folate from you and that you're not able to um, make the right size red blood cell. So those I are my- fully agree, fully mm -hmm. agree. Uh, and we'll post a link for the GI maps test there. Uh, uh, what, I, what I would want to know first is, uh, do you have a B12 or a folate insufficiency or deficiency? We're assuming that mm -hmm. because an elevated size of your red blood cells is suggestive of that. And that's a biomarker from the 1970s and 1980s. And we, we've all read the textbooks and that's very accurate. It could be, but there are more sensitive tests to tell if you've got enough B12 that your body is using and also folate. And there's an organic acids test, simple urine test, that will tell us, do you have enough methylmalonic acid or do you have too much methylmalonic acid? That is a really good biomarker of a B12 deficiency is methylmalonic acid, MMA. So you may not have a B12 deficiency. You may have elevated MCVs for other reasons. So I'd want to do the organic acids to look at MMA and also for mineral glutamic acid or FIGLU, which is the same kind of uh, marker, biomarker of a folate insufficiency in your cells. So you can have a whole bunch of folate in your bloodstream, but yeah, so you've got adequate levels, but if you have a FIGLU for mineral glutamic acid um, elevated, your body's not using it. And there's some reason for that, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I always would look to the gut first as where the reason's coming from. So the GI maps test would be a really good place to start. Mm -hmm. That's a good pearl. I don't test that enough, the fig glue. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. And the second question, which came from um, Al is what do low white blood cells mean? And let's, let's start there. What do low white blood cells mean? And could gluten be a trigger? Um, are you asking me first? <laughs> Um, so, you know, this is the realm I work in a lot, Dr. Tom, a lot of my patients have um, low white blood cells. So I see patients with a lot of chronic illnesses and, um, you know, who've been sick for a long time. And so I often see, you know, patients where their white blood cell count is really under five. I mean, it's usually typically most labs are under four to be flagged. Um, and so uh, the things that I think about that often um, can be an underlying cause, again, it's usually multifactorial or, um, you know, the body would be able to um, bounce back. So we think about, okay, what's affecting the bone marrow from making um, enough red, uh, white blood cells? Um, and it can be um, heavy metal stress, right? So there can be a environmental toxicant like heavy metals. There's so many other heavy metals, I'm sure, or um, environmental pollutants, I'm sure, that also have a um, suppressive effect on the bone marrow and uh, production of white blood cells. I just am most in tune with um, heavy metals. And that's, um, if you're treating what, that, what what you're saying there is that if a person has an accumulation of lead or mercury or other toxic chemicals that can either accumulate in the bones mm -hmm. or affect the bone structure, the only manifestation could be a low white blood cell count. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for breaking that down. That is exactly what I'm saying. And, um, you know, the metals that I often see are elevated and a lot of my patients are lead, mercury, arsenic, cadmium, and then aluminum. Um, it's not directly suppressive to the bone marrow, but um, again, that load, you know, on the body has a, a whole, um, you know, far reaching effects on the whole immune system, you know, so I see that. And then I see um, also this immunosuppressive effect from stealth pathogens. So, you know, Lyme and co-infections, viruses and retroviral infections are, you know, typically um, underlying causes that could um, be suppressing part of our immune system. And um, that can uh, look like low white, white blood cell counts or other deficiencies in the uh, immune system. So then that makes it easier for them to survive and thrive in your body. So what, what, what you're saying there is that a Lyme disease mm -hmm. or Epstein-Barr virus or other nasties, mm -hmm. if they um, develop in our body large concentrations of them, one of their survival mechanisms 
is to put the emergency brake on our body, making enough white blood cells to fight them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's that's why they're called stealth, right? They know how to, you know, evade and you know really um, adapt, um, you know, so that they thrive and survive, and our bodies are, um, you know, at a disadvantage. Right, right. That's a really important point. So it could be heavy metals, it could be pathogens. Uh, could gluten do it? So could food? Yeah, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely could. Uh, any food sensitivity. And, but the most common ones are wheat and dairy, soy. They're the most common. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, if you have accumulated too much glyphosate in your body from GMO foods, and, and uh, if you have high levels of glyphosate, that can suppress your immune system. That alters the good guys in your gut, mm -hmm. and there are too many bad guys, which can then have an effect of altering your white blood cell count and another part of your immune system, a critical part called secretory IgA, can be diminished easily. Mm -hmm. So once again, we're back to um, looking at the gut uh, uh, the, and looking at the microbiome and looking at heavy metals to see where in the heck is this coming from. But the first thing, this is what I wanted to say about this, about low white blood cell count, is that the question is, why is it there? Mm -hmm. Right? What is it? And what you're hearing from us is there's something that's put an emergency break on your body's ability to make white blood cells. There's something. Well, what is it? Well, how are we supposed to know? <laughs> no, we don't know. We, we know what's more common and, you know, we're happy to check, but we don't know. There's no magic answer, unfortunately. There's no magic answer to that. Uh, a few more shout outs. Um, Gwendolyn's in New Zealand. It's 1 p.m. on Wednesday. Thank you, Gwendolyn. Thank you. I got it now. So it wasn't three, it's one. And thanks for being here. Um, Allo asks, does Wi-Fi really make mycotoxins in the atmosphere more powerful? Mm -hmm. Good question. Yeah, you know, we see that um, clinically, you know, I know there's been some talks about some, you know, cursory studies of in a Wi-Fi, um, you know, high Wi-Fi environment that mold can become more virulent and meaning that it can produce more mycotoxins. I don't know about you, Dr. Tom, but I mean, I've only been practicing a little bit over 10 years and it seems like there is a increased um, uh, awareness or increased incidence of mold illness. And I don't know if it's just because we have a language around it and we know about it, or if there is is something that is changing in our environment, um, potentially an increase in Wi-Fi um, that is making molds that are associated with more uh, water damage more uh, toxic than they would be um, without that exposure. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious if you saw that, you know, years past. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've seen a tremendous increase and part of it is awareness. Yeah. Um, you know, there've been people like uh, Dave Asprey yeah. did a movie a number of years ago called Moldy. Uh, because he had mold infections. He, yep. he and his wife had mold infections. When they found out what it was, he was really upset, you know, and so he's, we're going after mold. And so yep. it's a great movie. It's, it's, um, it should be easy to find on the internet. And if my team can find it, they'll pull, post a link to it um, all, all about mold. And, I, and that brought a lot of awareness and others have talked about it a lot. But with the increase in two things that have happened in the last 20 years, and that is GMO foods, mm -hmm. three things, GMO foods, volumes of toxic chemicals that we're exposed to, and Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. and those three, all three of those, never before in, in the history of humanity have we been exposed to this stuff and at these levels, and we have no defense mm -hmm. against this. And, mm -hmm. we're, and we're being overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And we have to understand the magnitude of the exposures we're getting. That's why this event that Dr. Christine is doing on EMFs and electromagnetic pollution is so important so that you can get a bigger picture about this as this one aspect of the four sides of the pyramid, you know, but you get a really clear picture of this one and you'll start doing a few things like keep the phone off your body, mm -hmm. uh, Turn off the Wi-Fi at night. Just some simple things. Maybe, maybe you'll get a pong case. Uh, you know, the simple things that you can do to start with. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, 
Uh, Allison asks, it's uh, uh, Pong, P-O-N-G, Allison, P-O-N-G. Uh, let's see. And uh, Maria says, what is the name of the iPhone, okay, the iPhone case? Monica says, can you talk about having phone in different room but wearing Bluetooth ear device? Oh, sure. Let's just put a battery right next to our brain all the time. Oh, that's much safer than having the phone there. <laughs> what do you think? I'm sorry. I'm just taking advantage of the question. I'm, it's a good question, Monica. It really is. Uh, but this is the only thing that I recommend if you're going to be talking on the phone and you don't want to use a speaker, mm -hmm. uh, so you want a little more personal, is that you are plugged in, not a Bluetooth, because mm -hmm. you're putting a battery right into your brain when you do that. And it's, it's lower amplitude, but it's there all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time, whether it's uh, you're talking on it or not, you've got this battery next to your brain. Mm -hmm. And it's much worse for kids because kids' bone structure is so much thinner, these waves penetrate deeper into the brain for kids. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Schaffner, anything you want to add to that one? Yeah, no, I'm in agreement. And I think, um, you know, it's it's heartbreaking for me to see, right, the, you know, the children, right, that they're all, you know, and technology is not all bad, but it's like the, you know, the, them glued to the, you know, iPads and the, you know, wire, wireless earbuds and, you know, that exposure. And I, I think it's such a great point, Dr. Tom, that, you know, the developing brain, we need to still be very uh, cognizant of the exposure of our um, children because, um, you know, they're already born into this environment, right, with the glyphosate and the, you know, the heavy metals and the 287 chemicals in the cord blood. And it's like, you know, throwing this on top of um, that. I just think we really need to be, um, yeah, cognizant if you have young children about their exposure. You bet. You bet. Um, it's such a big effort on our part to educate mm -hmm. about kids. You know, we really want to do more. It's one of my personal goals. And now, because I've got an interest in it, you know, yeah. now we've got yeah. another one, yeah. uh, little one. And so uh, it's my top priority right mm -hmm. now is more education for about kids' health. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jennifer asks, how about the Apple Watches, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, the wearable devices, again, they're going to be, um, think about, just think about the equation, um, cumulative exposure over time, right? So if you have a, you know, watch on your body, you know, some people sleep with them even, you know, um, all the time, that's going to be significant. I um, I don't recommend um, for my patients the Apple Watch, but if you are really attached to it, you know, really um, making sure that you are um, maybe modifying your time of use during the day. Agreed on all, all points on that, I agree. Uh, Kim asks, is there any proof that the Harmony pendants protect from EMFs? You know, I um, I don't know about the Harmony pendant. Um, I think um, we have a mutual, a couple mutual friends, Dr. Tom, um, I think that utilize them. And I, I think they are doing some studies to try to um, figure out, you know, how that can maybe improve heart rate variability and uh, things like that, but I'm not connected with them. So um, I'm not sure. Yeah, well, you're actually, you're, you're right. You're right. The, the, the studies that they sent to me to begin with were mm -hmm. on heart rate variability. And what that means is the more consistent your heart function is, mm -hmm. the healthier your cardiovascular system is. Mm -hmm. And when you're under stress, your heart rates can vary quite a bit. And the, the monitoring technology is so sophisticated today, it's really easy to see how do you react when you're under a little stress? You know, you, you, you can wear a ring that records a lot of this information and then you look at a summary of a day and, uh, and you know, the, these rings, these aura rings, they're, they're generating some EMF themselves, uh, uh, unfortunately, but using the data gives you so much information as to where your vulnerabilities are. Mm -hmm. And on the Harmony bracelets, I've, I've been impressed. Marzi got one and I got one. Uh, some of my team members got them and it changed their tinnitus right away. Mm -hmm. uh, the ringing in their ears diminished right away as soon as they put it on, which was really impressive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dixie is checking in from Iowa. Nancy's here from Minnesota. Rich King from Cleveland. Allison says, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome, Allison. Kay Klein's in Florida. Debbie's in San Jose, California. 
Anne Marie's here from Naples. Shanquila has a question. What's the difference between cervical instability and a straight neck? How do you diagnose and does PRP or prolotherapy good for both? Oh, Shanquila, you're really, uh, good questions. <laughs> uh, that's a mechanical uh, question, so I'll start on that one. Uh, the difference between cervical instability and a straight neck. Uh, cervical instability means that, see, we have seven bones in our neck and our skull is sitting on, so it's like you've got seven empty spools of thread mm -hmm. and with a bowling ball sitting on top of it. And the way the bowling ball is balanced is because there's a curve to your neck from the side, if you look. And that way, the weight of the bowling ball goes to straight down to the first bone, but you know they're, they're curving now, so it dissipates a little bit. Then down to the next bone, dissipates a little, the next bone dissipates a little bit. And then when we turn our head, every spool of the spool of thread is moving. And there's five tiny little muscles between each bones. So they're all working like a team. It's, it's, it's almost like a fine watch you know, in terms of how well it works. But when you lose that curve in your neck and when your neck gets straight, or if you get a reverse curve in your neck and your head's in front of your shoulders, I'm exaggerating so you can see it. When you lose the curve in your neck, your joints start wearing down. Mm -hmm. And um, this is a, a, a prerequisite mechanism in the development of arthritis in your neck. Lots of headaches come from this, lots of pain down the arm, pain into the chest, pain into the middle of the shoulder blades can come from this. The discs can wear down because you're turning your head all day long, but now you know, it's kind of like you're driving your car down the road and you hit a great big bump, boom, and it just rattles you. And you keep driving and you wonder, did the tire blow up or anything? And uh, okay, I guess, I guess I'm okay here. Okay, I guess I'm okay. And then you drive away and forget about it. But if that you knock that tire out of balance six months from now, that tire's worn down compared to the other tires. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens in your neck and, and your entire spine. But that's what happens in your neck. So the loss of a curve sets you up for the arthritis. Mm -hmm. Cervical instability means that some of the bones or the ligaments aren't doing their job, not the bones, some of the muscles mm -hmm. and the tendons or the ligaments aren't doing their job anymore. And one or more of the bones are moving in a way they're not supposed to move, no mm -hmm. matter what, they're, it's unstable. That's dangerous. Mm -hmm. And if you've got instability, uh, true instability, you may try uh, the prolotherapy, that's the PRP that she's asking about, but you have to have someone that really knows what they're doing. But mm -hmm. that could be a surgical case. That mm -hmm. could, if it's true instability, it's not hard to tell. You just do the x-rays, motion x-rays, tilt your head down, mm -hmm. tilt your head up, turn your head to the side. And they take x-rays in each of those positions. And you can see, you know, it, anybody who knows how to read x-rays can see what it's supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. And that's how you can tell. That was a really good question. I haven't done a mechanical question like that in a while. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Jacqueline's here from the Philippines. Hey, Jacqueline, tell us what time it is uh, uh, in the Philippines. And thank you for joining. Lynn's here from British Columbia. Paul's here from Wellness Works, LLC. Allison says, what are the tests I should be requesting for my endoscopy? I have gluten sensitivity and recently discovered I have um, acid reflux. Oh, good. Um, uh, an IEL intraepithelial lymphocyte count, an IEL count is critical when you're doing an endoscopy. And all it is, you know, they're gonna take out a little bit of tissue, they're gonna snip a little piece of your intestines and bring and look at it under a microscope. And to do an IEL count, you just look in the microscope and there's like a little grade um, uh, with marks on it. So you can measure distances and all that when you're looking through. And you just have to, in a particular size square of your tissue, count how many lymphocytes are there. It's an intraepithelial lymphocyte count, IEL count. It costs 40 bucks to do it, but it gives you so much information 
that if you don't do an IEL count, you don't know like how bad or are you on the path to something you just don't know. Mm -hmm. So it's an IEL count. Dr. Shafter, anything else uh, to that that you'd like to add? No, I think that that's great. And I think just with the um, reflux or the GERD, just I um, look for H. pylori a lot um, as well. And, you know, yes. a map test or, you know, there's lots of other tests that look at that, but that can be a bacterial overgrowth at, at the root of some of those symptoms. Yeah, um, I do a case study in a couple of presentations I did last week of a 44-year-old guy that developed alopecia, losing mm -hmm. his hair. And it was a heliobacter infection. Um, yeah. And, and when they cured the heliobacter, the alopecia went away and his hair came back, a full crop of hair. And you see it at six weeks, eight weeks, 16 weeks, 44 weeks, more hair coming, more hair coming, and just drops your jaw. That okay. it was a bacterial infection causing the autoimmune disease. Yeah, 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 that's such a great story. Uh, Paul asks, would you do a blood test first to determine the necessity to investigate heavy metal toxicity before testing for it? I've been to, I've been one to go for the metals first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, um, blood testing is another, you know, one avenue to look at heavy metals. Um, typically, it's really with um, acute exposure that we see heavy metals in the blood. I rarely see them in the blood, but it's it's good to test for them if you have access to that and coverage. It could be a good screen. Every now and then, I'm really surprised where we can pick up an aluminum level or, you know, um, even lead or mercury. Um, our body um, quickly moves metals out of the blood and stores them in different tissues. And so um, why heavy metal testing, I think, has or heavy metals um, has been really in the alternative world for a long time is because, um, you know, we have to look at testing from many different levels. And so there's blood, there's hair, there's also what we call the urine provocation test, where we give somebody a provoking agent. So it's usually a um, either oral chelator or through IV therapy. And that gives us a snapshot of people's heavy metal burden. So that that chelator, like a DMSA or a DMPS or an ADTA, grabs metals that it can, and then you measure them in the uh, urine. You usually collect your urine for six hours. Again, um, you know, and then you have to interpret that. So if no metals come out, that can mean that your body is in a retention matter, uh, pattern. And then it's a really good sign if your body can eliminate metals um, when given those agents. So it's um, definitely, I feel like with heavy metal um, treatment and uh, testing, you just really want to look, you know, clinically um, at what's symptoms are going on, occupational exposures, and then use testing to guide you. But um, there's a lot of um, clinical diagnosis and therapeutic trials that go into um, a treatment plan around heavy metals. Right. Agreed. Agreed. We, there are um, three different ways that I know of. Uh, well, there's more, but the three primary ways are, as Dr. Schaffner said, hair, blood, and urine. Mm -hmm. uh, the blood test um, is what the government recommends looking for children and toxicity, uh, but it's only valid for two weeks after exposure that, as Dr. Schaffner said, your body does everything it can to get, get the stuff out of the bloodstream, get it off the highway. It's not supposed to be here. So it gets thrown into storage, which is in your bones for lead, uh, in your kidneys for arsenic, uh, aluminum, mercury go throughout the body but it's not in the bloodstream anymore. So doing a blood, blood test is really good to look for acute exposure. You break a mercury thermometer in your mouth, your blood test is gonna be high in mercury. You can count on that. The second test is a hair analysis. And depending on the lab, if it's a good lab, it's a valid test, mm -hmm. but their technology requires, they, they can only look at one inch of hair from the nape of your neck. Right? So if your hair is six inches long, you got to cut it at the nape of the neck and cut off five inches, throw it away, and you use that one inch, right? Um, but then it's an accurate test because one inch of, it's about uh, two months worth of growth. About an inch of hair is about two months, give or take, worth of growth. Um, and, you, and any metals or minerals that are in the bloodstream are going to have some deposit in the hair, the new hair that's growing. Mm -hmm. So that's why hair analysis can be a good test of what you've been exposed to in the last two months. Mm -hmm. But we're looking at chronic disease. And so you want to get this stuff out of storage. And so doing a provocative test, and we've been doing this for uh, 
30 years now, I think, mm -hmm. uh, where, as Dr. Schaffner said, you use an agent that acts like a magnet to pull this stuff out of storage, and then you collect their urine. Uh, uh, Dr. Schaffner does six hours, and we've collected it longer than that. Um, in the early days, we we're doing it for 24 hours, mm -hmm. and then collecting the sample from that. Uh, and you're shocked at what you find. Uh, it's, it's really remarkable to see. And the rule of thumb is we don't retest again until we've gone, gone through 10 cycles of pulling this stuff out. Mm -hmm. you know, for example, uh, I, I would give these chelating agents for three days mm -hmm. and, uh, and then collect the urine for 24 hours. And uh, so then the treatment protocol would be three days of um, chelation and then 11 days off three days on, 11 days off. So you give the body a break and there's different ways of doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, some, some people will use lower doses of chelation on a daily basis, mm -hmm. and, but you also want to work on detox and all that. So for Paul who asked the question, um, uh, blood test is not the way to go if you're looking for long-term exposure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Alice asked, how do we know what type of magnesium to take? Good question. Um, do you have any pro tips? I mean, I, I am, um, you know, Dr. Tom, I use a form of um, muscle testing, right, to really individualize treatment for my patients. So of course, I use um, clinical assessment and history, but I often check in um, with, you know, the biofeedback of my patient's body to really hone in on what they need. And there's so many great magnesiums out there, right? So with a lot of people who are listening, probably, um, you know, there's uh, magnesium three and eight for the brain, there's glycinate and malate, and um, there's also oxide and citrate for constipation. And so, um, no, but, and there's um, products, you know, I haven't, um, played with them enough, but there are blends, right, that have combinations that can be, you know, if you just want to cover your bases and make sure that you have, you know, a little bit of everything, there are more blends coming out that have a um, blend of the magnesiums. I agree. I agree with everything you said. Um, I don't know of a protocol to determine what type of magnesium is best for you other than muscle testing mm -hmm. or, or vol, um, electroacupuncture yeah. work. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I think it's quite helpful to do that at times. I really like magnesium three and eight because I'm so focused on brain function for people. And it's an epidemic that people don't know about. Most people don't realize where their brains are at in terms of inflammation and killing off brain cells. Uh, I think I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, Blue Cross Blue Shield came out um, last year and between 2013 and 2017, there has been a 407% increase in the diagnosis of Alzheimer's in the 30 to 45 year olds. Oh my God. 100% in four years. Yes. And there is a huge epidemic right now that is going to hit us hard in the healthcare mm -hmm. system because uh, people are not people are unknowingly killing off their brains. Mm -hmm. So when I'm recommending magnesium, I often, my go-to may be a magnesium three and eight to get the added benefit of calming down the brain a bit. Yeah, uh, I've got no science for that. That's just my clinical uh, preference right mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Um, Kat says, anything at all that we can do for our body for vertigo? Mm. Yeah, vertigo can be tricky, but it can be, um, you know, typically I, um, it can be a viral um, infection um, in the cranial nerve. And so I usually use um, antiviral support and then, um, you know, fluid and electrolyte balance um, can be really important. Um, and so, and then, um, you know, with your world, right? So people um, who are experiencing vertigo can um, go to a provider and ask for something called the Epley maneuver that can um, shift, um, you know, the crystals in the ear to help um, with um, getting their balance back. And so that I've seen, and there's actually, um, I've had a handful of patients. I just love how medicine works these days. Um, there are YouTube videos on how to do the Epley maneuver on yourself now. And I've had a couple DIY Epley maneuvers <laughs> that worked. Wow. I've worked for certain, um, certain patients. So um, those are a couple of things that I um, think about. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the way I'll look at it is, okay, vertigo, all right, it's a neurological problem. 
-hmm. Okay, it's something with the brain and the nerves um, that has you out of balance. Okay, where is it? Is it structural? Is it biochemical? Is it emotional? Or is it electromagnetic? I mean, it can be any of them. Mm. Structural, there are many, many studies in the world of chiropractic and vertigo. My gosh, I've helped hundreds of people, literally. Well, maybe a couple hundred, I guess. I've never kept track. You know, by just doing the structural work on their neck and upper back area, um, if you've lost the curve in your neck, that may be enough to set you off. There's a type of chiropractic care called HIO, uh, and it's upper cervical work. And these chiropractors are experts, and they only work with the top of the neck where it meets the skull. Mm -hmm. And they get dramatic results sometimes. And chiropractors that work on the entire spine, including that area, get dramatic results sometimes. You know, So there's no one technique that's right for everybody. But for vertigo, I certainly would include evaluating the structure to see if that's contributing to it. On the biochemistry, I'd look right away to viruses and um, I might look for antibodies to some of the bacteria and viruses to see if your immune system's really fighting hard and losing the battle right now that may be contributing to that. Gluten, uh, just Google gluten and vertigo and you'll see the studies that, you know, that could do it. So the biochemical side of it, EMFs, I had one patient who, uh, uh, developed vertigo over a relatively short period of time and couldn't find anything. I said, well, what changed in your life? What, what changed? Nothing changed. Oh, come on, something changed. You try new food, are you using a new salad dressing? I mean, uh, something is different. No, nothing's different. What's different in the house? Well, no, nothing's different in the house. You know, it's actually kind of nice. You know, uh, oh, oh, well, we put smart meters on. Mm -hmm. When did the smart meters go on the house? Oh, just oh, th three weeks before the vertigo started. Mm -hmm. And I said, get the smart meters off the house. Mm -hmm. And they called to have the smart meters removed and the utility company didn't want to do it. They said, get this off my house. And so they came out and they took the smart meter off and the vertigo was gone in about a week. Mm -hmm. So it was EMF overload mm -hmm. for that person, right? And so we knew that we had to educate them about turn your Wi-Fi off at night, get a pong on your, on your phone, don't put the phone up to your ear, all the things that we can think of, because that was a very vulnerable area for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Sean asks, is mold tied to histamine sensitivity? And can you test for histamine since you know you have mold in the GI system? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen a lot of, um, again, it could be like more awareness, but there's definitely, I would say, an increase in patients who have, they're on the spectrum of um, mast cell or kind of histamine, um, hyper, like overreactions of mast cells producing histamine, and then that can create a whole host of symptoms. And I think of the driving force um, underneath that is typically um, related to many things, but I think of mold, parasitic infections. I think about, um, you know, mast cells kind of survey our body in the extracellular matrix, and that can be an area where um, it can be high in glyphosate or metals or, you know, other pathogens can be in that interstitial fluid that can be, um, you know, basically also affecting the mast cells um, overactivity. But there's definitely a strong relationship in my um, patient population that patients who have uh, mold, so that can be mold illness, it can be chronic inflammatory response syndrome, it can be mycotoxin toxicity, kind of that picture with um, mast cell, and then that also can look at um, some people can have POTS or um, vagus nerve um, dysautonomia, that kind of thing, but they kind of go hand in hand, a lot of those um, symptoms. So um, I missed the question about testing um, about histamine. Um, uh, uh, I think she had mold identified in a GI test. Okay, got it, got it, yeah. That can be, I would definitely, you know, clear up the mold and see how you feel, you know, and um, that would be, you know, a good thing. And I, I've been adding more and more um, natural and sometimes um, compounded um, strategies to help um, stabilize mast cells or um, histamine um, receptors in the body to help people feel better while we're treating uh, the underlying cause of why that their, their system is so hyper allergic and reactive. 
Do you guys hear a similarity to all of our answers, irrespective <laughs> of what the question is? Do you, do you hear the common links, right? Toxins, mold, heavy metals, that you have to look for this stuff. If you think from the perspective of the pyramid to any health problem, it can help you dial down what direction to begin in. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Not always are you gonna get the right answer, oh my gosh, this is a mechanical problem. Mm -hmm. That always won't be um, accurate, but it's a good place to start. It gives you the map to start uh, in looking at this. Mm -hmm. uh, Kay says, I'm a 62 year young female with no breast cancer issues. My doctor is insisting I get an annual mammogram. I'm concerned about EMF exposure. How safe are mammograms? What's the safest type? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, that's a great insight and a great um, question. I think mammography can have a place, but I do agree that it is not without risk and it can be, uh, in my opinion, overused. Um, there are some technologies that I hope that can become more um, popular that use ultrasound first as a screening technology. Um, and then, you know, I do, um, you know, I, I do think um, potentially, you know, a baseline mammogram for women at some point could be insight, uh, like um, helpful, especially if you're going to do hormone replacement therapy and so forth. But again, I am in full agreement that um, I do think they're overprescribed, overused, and there's a lot of other um, technologies that we should be using um, to help women navigate, um, you know, breast cancer prevention. Mm -hmm. I, I fully agree. Um, so if there's no history of breast cancer in your family, mm -hmm. and if, if you're really concerned, you might do the genetic test to see if you carry the genes for breast cancer. And if there's no indicators of a genetic vulnerability, and no family history, then I would ask your doctor, it sounds like he has yeah, a male, I would ask him, does he do a testogram every year? Is, is he doing radiation to his testicles every year to see, you know, are there any problems? Or is he even having them palpated every year? Mm -hmm. You know, throw it back at him. <laughs> and if, what, what, well, of course not. Well, you know, so, I, I agree with Dr. Schaffner. She's so much more delicate at <laughs> explaining that the, over, the overuse of mammograms is really terrible. Now, if you have a family history, mm. if you have genetic vulnerabilities, that's a different discussion. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, but, or if you have a history of fibrocystic breasts, that's mm. a different discussion. Uh, but if there's no history, no risk markers whatsoever, as your questions stated, then um, I would have a hard time agreeing with that recommendation. Mm -hmm. uh, Rich asks, why are some people more affected by mold than others? Mm -hmm. It's a good question, and people have thought about this. Um, so um, like anything, right, it's um, as Dr. Tom and I are talking, right, so um, there's often, you know, a patient and then the family member, right, and the family member often is not symptomatic while the patient is, and there's, they're around some of the exact same exposures, right, so we're always asking the question, you know, what makes some, one person sick and another person not, and of course genetics can play a role, um, but, you know, I know functional medicine does this well, and, you know, the way that I was trained to is really looking at the health story of an individual and understanding, you know, um, you know, from very early, right, what sets up their microbiome and then, you know, thinking about um, other, you know, exposures and their dental history and their vaccine history and, you know, so forth. And um, some people can be more vulnerable to environmental uh, toxicants than others, and that can be epigenetic related. Um, Dr. Shoemaker, who really kind of put his flag in the mold world early on, um, and he's he's a brilliant doctor in a lot of ways, and he um, he looked at HLA haplotyping for people who had mold exposure and found, or that had mold illness rather, and found that you know, 25%, he thought in his study that can't clear mold effectively out of their body. So those are gonna be the, the people who are the canaries in the coal mine and the, the patients that are sick. So I think it's this combination, Rich, of epigenetics, and then what is your own, you know, health story and kind of like how full is your bucket before you've been exposed 
um, to living in black mold or so forth. None of this is good for anyone, but it's again, why, um, yeah, why are some people so drastically ill and others are not? Really good answer, very thorough. Um, mm -hmm. They've done a number of studies on identical twins mm -hmm. uh, and looking at, for example, do they develop multiple sclerosis? Do both of them develop any disease or breast cancer? And there are many studies that have been done like this and they consistently find that identical twins do not develop the same diseases. Mm -hmm. But wait a minute, their genes are identical. How come one develops rheumatoid arthritis and the other one doesn't? How come, well, why is that? And they dialed it down to, remember we've talked before, Professor Fasano's um, uh, paper, all disease begins in the gut, mm -hmm. right? In the leaky gut. And it's the development of the microbiome in your gut over time that determines to a large degree your resilience or your vulnerability to everything you're exposed to. 36% of all the small molecules in the healthy blood are the metabolites, the exhaust from the microbiome in your gut. 36%, that's one third of everything in your bloodstream. So what that means, and th those, those metabolites are messengers going to your brain telling the brain how much melatonin to make and serotonin and all those kinds of things. And to your heart, for your heart rate and to your liver for uh, filtration and detox, to your kidneys for filtration. Your gut controls all of that, mm -hmm. all of it. So, and with identical twins, they would find that the twin with a disease has a microbiome very similar to other people that have the same disease not similar to the twin. Mm -hmm. So they've, they've got the same genes, but wait a minute. So this person with rheumatoid has so much more of the pathogenic bacteria that's commonly seen in many rheumatoid patients. But this twin that doesn't have rheumatoid doesn't have that bacteria. Mm -hmm. So it's what is on the end of your fork over a lifetime that has a huge determination on your microbiome. Mm -hmm. There's much more to it, and we've done other Facebook Lives on that. But that's my answer to that question of how come mo some people are more sensitive to mold? How come some people are more sensitive to mercury? How come so some people are more sensitive to lead? How come some people are more sensitive to emotions? And because of the environment and the environmental triggers that have accumulated in your lifetime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well said. <laughs> Thank you. Can EMF exposure cause autoimmune disease? Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, I think when we think about it, I'm, I come from the perspective, again, sounding like a broken record, that autoimmunity underlying that is typically a, um, it's typically a combination of a, um, a pathogen stress um, or, and or an environmental toxicant. And I, I do think electrosmog is in the realm of environmental toxicants. Um, I think the mechanisms still need to be worked out, but I think there are, you know, um, you know we know that um, EMF can deplete our melatonin, our glutathione. We know that it can increase peroxynitrite um, and really create a lot of oxidative stress in our body. Um, and it contributes a whole host of endocrine issues. And you know, fertility issues. And so I think that there are many mechanisms to paint the picture that it is um, potentially a trigger. Well said, well said. Nothing to add to that. That was well said. Mm -hmm. uh, Frank says, I'm stuck in Jersey. How are you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, Dr. Schaffner, how are you? <laughs> <You're> great. <laughs> right, we're great, Frank. Thanks so much. <laughs> Jennifer says, what does it mean when have Saccharomyces cerevisiae is elevated in serum? Huh, in the serum. Um, I think she means antibodies. Yeah, I was- If, if I, you've got elevated Saccharomyces cerevisiae in your serum, you've got a major problem. Yeah. That's a fungal infection of a, of a large degree. Yeah. Uh, so um, Dr. Schaffner, let's assume it's antibodies. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, whenever we have an antibody um, indicator, you know, our immune system is invested in um, clearing either that pathogen or that toxicant. And then, of course, when we see this overexpression of certain antibodies to certain things, then that, that we can get in the realm of um, autoimmunity and molecular mimicry and things. And so I would say um, I haven't, I'm just trying to think, I, I've never really worked with that clinically, but I would say the the yeast overgrowth um, is something that your your body is really vested in trying to clear. And so really looking at overall microbiome, overall exposures, yeast overgrowth to me, I mean, of course, we have to look at all the microbial influences, but um, I also look at um, mercury exposure because I think that the, typically if you have persistent fungal infections or yeast overgrowth in the body, you can still be, you know, your terrain is typically high in mercury and, you know, you need to do both to really clear it. Really, really uh, comprehensive answer. I agree. And um, if it's antibodies, it's ASCA, A-S-C-A, ASCA antibodies. Um, they are common in celiacs. Mm -hmm. uh, I've not seen a study on wheat-related disorders, so uh, non-celiac people. I'm sure that they're high, but I just don't have the references uh, for that. And they, they have molecular mimicry with myelin. Mm -hmm. And so if you make antibodies to ASCA, Saccharomyces cerevisiae antibodies, those antibodies can attack your myelin, which is a saran wrap around your nerves. Mm -hmm. And you can eventually develop neurological symptoms. I mean, the end stage of that is MS, but any peripheral neuropathies, numbness and tingling can be from that. Um, now, if you're referring to Saccharomyces cerevisiae elevated in your blood, you, you got a major problem. And that's not something to mess around with. So, uh, but I'm, I'm hoping you meant antibodies, which is still a problem if you've got elevated antibodies. All right, we'll do a couple more. Uh, Tricia says, my he heater thermostat uses Wi-Fi. It's not in my bedroom. Any comments? Mm -hmm. it's, so it's not in your, bi um, in your bedroom. Um, you know, again, um, I would still turn off your um, Wi-Fi router at night if you can. Um, again, if you're living in, you know, the Northeast or a place where you're on, you know, again, that that's going to, um, you know, affect your thermostat, then we have to reconsider. But again, you can always, one of the cool things about um, the more awareness around this is that there are more devices that are more affordable that you can um, measure the RF exposure. Um, that you're getting from that thermostat. And again, distance is your friend. And again, we want to, you know, make sure you're in a, sleep, a safe sleeping location, but you can always check. You can always um, see, you know, what the exposure is um, with an RF meter and then also measure your bedroom um, just to make sure things look good. Really good point. I was thinking the same thing. And we'll put the link here to the meter that we looked at. This was about a year and a half ago. I looked at four or five different meters and I talked to a couple experts and we found one that was not expensive that is comprehensive and that everyone should get a meter to check their house or or do it with your neighbor split the cost i think it's about 140 bucks or something i think so something like that uh, but you scan every wall in your house and i used to give these meters to my patients back in the 1990s and i had to take it home for a night and scan every wall because a mouse can chew on the wire and the, the wiring can be leaking EMFs in, into your room. Mm -hmm. Or if your bedroom is on the other side of the wall where the color television is and they're watching television, the EMFs coming right into you, into your bed can be huge. Mm -hmm. So you use the meter and you check your whole house. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, in terms of uh, this person with their heater on Wi-Fi. Uh, that I guess that's a modern house. Uh, my opinion: you don't want to live in a modern house like that. You know, so I'm not don't I'm not saying move, but I would have them run a wire from the wall where the thermostat is down to the basement or or through the ceiling to get to the furnace room and get it off Wi-Fi because every exposure you have, you know, even these little things, these little speakers, you know, you know, I'm, what room I go into work here, cause we're renting this house that we're in. I've, I've got two speakers. One is playing music for my son, music, you know, Mozart for babies all the time. 
but the phone that's playing that music is right next to the speaker. So it's not going out anywhere else. But this one, when it's not in use, it's always turned off. Mm -hmm. That we turn off these things when we're not using them. Mm -hmm. uh, because leaving them on is just having, they're sending a message out asking for more um, signals. Say, where are you? Where are you? Come, come to me. I'm receptive. I'm receptive. Right? And you just don't want that in your home because it's all accumulative. And the amount of environmental toxins we're getting exposed to is not going to go down. Mm -hmm. It's only going to go up. Mm -hmm. So uh, Dr. Schaffner, uh, oh my God, we're already over time. Uh, and Marcy just came in to give me the hook. Uh, <laughs> but um, my question about your event is, is it primarily or exclusively focused on electromagnetic frequencies? Yeah, we, um, we talk a lot about EMF, but um, it's the you know, body electric. So my goal for this summit, this is the second version. And um, you've been on a lot of my summits, Dr. Tom, and you were on the first one, which I so appreciate. And, and we are really trying to um, give people a language of understanding of um, the science behind energy medicine and the you know biophysical nature of our bodies. So we cover um, EMF, we cover, cover water, we co cover sound, light, um, even intention, breath work, all of these, um, you know, fun things, different modalities and tools. So it's just, it's so fun for me to do these summits and I get to learn so much and, you know, implement these things in practice because the goal um, behind this always has been, how do we, um, you know, find more and more tools to help accelerate our patient's healing, right? And that's where I find when we marry biochemistry with biophysics, we can really um, have that opportunity for our patients. That's really great. Uh, screw, marrying biochemistry and biophysics. And as a chiropractor, I, I guess we'd be a threesome because I would bring in biomechanics. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, and I, you know, the more I study like the fascia and, you know, all of this um, structural, you know, component of our health, you know, it's amazing how it's not only, you know, the structural, um, you know, protein or these structural aspects, but also they are biochemical and they are, they do um, conduct light and move electrons throughout our body. So yeah, it's, I think it's, you know, where yeah. all action is, right? That's right. That's right. We, we hold a lot of memory in our tissue. Yeah. Of that have happened to us yeah well um we'll post the link here again everyone so please register for this event and if you pick up one pearl that you use the rest of your life just one of the many that you'll hear about it'll well have been worthwhile mm -hmm. uh, dr shaffner thank you once again for being here thanks for sharing your wisdom and your knowledge uh, you're uh, just a wonderful walking encyclopedia to helping us to have a bigger picture Oh, well, thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.